and thank you everyone for joining. Yeah. Really appreciate it. All right, it is now three past 10. So um, I would like uh, to uh, welcome everyone for uh, joining today's uh, inaugural uh, Meet the Author event uh, run by uh, the Sydney Nano Early and Mid-Career Ambassador Network. At e, I guess we are an EMCR uh, network of early career academics. So I'm Alessandro Tunis. I'm uh, with the Faculty of Science here at the School of Physics. Um, and joining me in co-hosting this event is Amandeep Kaur. Uh, perhaps Amandeep, you also want to say a quick hello and introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, I'm really excited to host Muhammad in this uh, Meet the Author and Meet the Inventor series. Um, and I'm sure he's got some exciting things to share about his research and research today. Um, so yeah, my name is Amandeep Kaur, as um, Alessandro has mentioned. I am at the Faculty of Medicine and Health. I'm a University of Sydney fellow. Great. So I, I might just ask if, if you can uh, mute yourself or if Tui, you can uh, perhaps uh, just uh, monitor the muting situation. So, uh, so this is a, the first of a series uh, of, of um, seminars we thought we'd give to... So one of our roles as ambassadors to, uh, to help a little bit with member engagement, uh, particularly across the early and mid-career net, uh, network and early mid-career researchers, which are, in a sense, some of the most uh, vulnerable um, members of, of, of the uh, research community. And so uh, we thought we would start these, uh, these initiatives, which allow us to showcase some of our greatest talent. So um, uh, perhaps I'll start by introducing Mohammed, but I think he'll be talking a little bit about himself, so I don't want to give too much away, but I'll just maybe quickly uh, read out his bio. So uh, Mohammed Mirkalov is a research fellow and lecturer at the Biomaterials and Tissue Engineering Research Unit at UCID since September 2018. Um, he's uh, Traveled quite a lot and studied in a number of different places, uh, including uh, the is Isfahan University of Technology in uh, Nanyang in Singapore, at McGill in Canada, and uh, and now has uh, joined us here at the University um, of Sydney. Um, and perhaps I will not read out the entire bio because I don't want to give away any of uh, anything more that he might have to say. So uh, with that, I might just uh, leave it up to you, Mohammed. Uh, take it away when you're ready. Uh, thank you so much, Alessandro, and thank you everyone for joining this talk. Um, so when we were discussing with uh, Alessandro and Amandeep about this talk, they advised me to talk about myself because this is about me and getting to know each other. And I found it quite hard because of two reasons. One of them is that I've never talked about myself. I've talked about my research quite a lot, but not about myself. And also, it usually doesn't reflect the whole reality because we tend to talk about our successes and um, achievements. But um, please note, uh, especially the ones who are more junior than me, that um, for every success, every achievement that I talk about today, there are tens or more failures. And there have been days, weeks, and even months that I have tried to achieve something and I have failed. And this is the nature of research. And I enjoy it. Um, so the, the, the thing to keep in mind is just to not to stop and, and, and move forward. So yeah, my name is Mohammed Mikhalaf, as, um, as Alessandro said. I'm a research fellow lecturer at the Biomaterials uh, Tissue Engineering Research Unit. Um, and today I'll talk a little bit about myself and about my research. I was born in Iran. Uh, in a city called Iswan. I bring you a few photos of Iran and Iswan here uh, for two reasons. One of them is to show how beautiful it is. Iran is a country in the, in the Middle East and has um, as a like a big history basically. Um, the, the architecture I'm showing you on the, on the left belongs to 2,500 years ago. The one on the, on the river is in my home city and it belongs to 500 years ago. So it's beautiful. I enjoy life there. And um, whenever I go there, it just reminds me of if this um, is- Sorry, Mohammed. Yep. I think you haven't shared the screen. We will see you. Or is it's just me? No, we are. Uh, oh, you're seeing my, my slides? I, 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 can, I can see the slides very uh, well. I can see as well. I can see. I'm sorry, Payman. It must be something on your end. Oh, sorry, Payman. OK, sure. No worries. Yeah. 
So whenever I go there, um, it just reminds me of the things that these people have been achieving like hundreds to thousands of years ago. And if this is something they could do back in that time, we just need to do better. And that's something to share with you as well. Um, so the purpose of showing this is, is that as well. So I did my bachelor's there and I enjoyed life uh, hanging around these historical places. And then I asked our, asked our scholarship, that's probably the most prestigious um, graduate scholarship in Singapore, brought me to, to do research as a master's student at Nanyang Technological University with uh, Muruke Shanwara Kematan and Toshu Bank. There I worked on endoscopic systems. I learned um, a lot about them. And there are two things I want to mention about Singapore. One of them is that it's a very neat city, very clean city. So this life is quite enjoyable there. And probably more importantly for researchers, the research infrastructure at NTU and NUS, NUS is um, National University of Singapore, is just fascinating. So it contributes, it can contribute to a very successful research career really there. And my, my master's project was successful too. I published a few articles and uh, I was offered a, um, a PhD scholarship both at NTU and NUS, but back in that time I was in love with the lady who was finishing her bachelor's back in Iran. So I went back to Iran and I worked in industry for one year uh, until she finished her bachelor's. And then I got two um, doctoral awards from McGill, McGill Engineering Doctoral Award and McGill International Doctoral Award, um, um, which brought me to, to Montreal, um, Canada, to work with François Bartela. Uh, about Montreal, it's a fun city. Uh, we enjoyed life there. Um, we lived there for, for seven years almost. And so we enjoyed life there. But it's a very cold city. So if you plan to go there, and the winters are quite long. Um, just bring a good winter jacket and good uh, shoes, basic winter shoes, um, <laughs> uh, to survive there, basically. Um, about uh, working at McGill, I learned a lot from Francois, really, about theoretically and applied mechanics. And we discussed um, a lot of things, and that fired up a lot of ideas. So we had long discussions and debates, and we challenged each other quite a lot. And that was the beauty of it. So my PhD was quite successful because of these discussions, really. Um, so at the end of PhD, I, I published a few articles, and right after that, I was offered a postdoc position at Andre Studos lab at ETH Switzerland. But at the same time, I was offered an NSERC postdoctoral fellowship, and NSERC is basically Canada's main funding agencies like ARC. So, uh, and this is probably the most prestigious postdoctoral award there. I was offered an FQRNT postdoctoral award. That's FQRNT is Quebec's main funding agency. If NSW had a like, postdoctoral award funding agency for that, that would be equivalent to this. And um, an NRC postdoctoral award, I was NRC's Canadian National Lab. Um, and I was offered it because I was involved in an NRC at the end of PhD, I started working with them. Uh, I was offered a postdoctoral award from them as well. That was an internal award and a 0.5 million funding project from NRC to continue doing research on what, what I was doing basically. So with that, I stayed in Canada. Um, and um, I continued doing my research. I've been you an example here. So this is basically on the left, I'm showing you a laminated glass. My research was on basically improving the fracture toughness of glasses and ceramics. Uh, and here I'm showing you a laminated glass. That's the best product in the market that is used for wind shield and blue and bulletproof glasses. And if you see the deformation behavior of it, you can see that uh, the material is basically quite good. It, it is 10 to 100 times more impact resistant than monolithic glasses, normal glasses. But when it fails, the failure is catastrophic. So cracks propagate through the material and it's the end of the story. On the, on the right side, I'm showing you the bio-inspired glass that we developed. And you can see that while it is, um, in terms of transparency, it's similar to monolithic glass, it's like three, 4% less transparent, according to the standard tests. Um, in terms of um, stiffness and strength and, uh, and the scratch resistance and these things, it's basically exactly like glass or even better in some cases. But in terms of impact resistant and resistant to basically puncture, it was four times more impact resistant than the best product, best product in the market. And that's why we could basically publish a few nice articles in this area and also we did similar research on 
um, similar, but it's, I, I don't have time to go over all my research in ceramics as well, but we did topologically interlocked ceramics um, that performs, that actually achieve a similar level of uh, impact resistance. Um, so we published the results, and then I was thinking that this uh, could be directly relevant to bioceramics as well, because brittleness is one of the main limitations in bioceramics, and probably translation to industries in bio-related fields is easier. So I was looking for options, and um, I was offered a postdoc position at Jigong Sous Lab at Harvard to work in this area. So I waited one year for a visa. Back in that time, I didn't still have my Canadian uh, passport. I waited for more than one year for a visa. And one evening, my brother, who is now an assistant prof at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, um, called me and said, Mohamed, have you seen this job at the University of Sydney to work on bioceramics? I know that you like to work in this area. And I said, no, please send it to me. So, so he sent the job out to me. And it was fascinating. Um, so I applied for the job a few days after. I started writing a proposal. I sent a proposal on my CV and those things, and I had an interview. Hala gave me the job, and I was happy and said, oh, it's good. It's, uh, it's even probably better. Why not? Um, because Hala's team has a lot of experience in bioceramics, and this is something I want to work on. So I moved to the University of Sydney. During the first six months of my stay, I filed two patents. One of them was on development of a 3D, 4D printing procedure for bioceramics. One of them was on novel bioceramic compositions. And after that, I was involved in many um, very challenging and interesting research projects with Hala's team, um, her collaborators. And I'm very thankful to Hala for this opportunity, really. So I started working on, on a lot of different, um, a lot of different um, interesting projects. And um, so today I'm uh, talking a little bit about the 3D, 4D printing project that I, um, that I basically developed a technique for. But before going to that, let me give you a, a brief, um, uh, basically, background of the project. Um, so some of you I can see probably know that um, segmental bone defect is, is still an unmet challenge, clinical challenge at the interface between science, engineering, um, and medicine. Um, these defects can result from cancer, from accidents, from other diseases, from sport incidents, trauma, or congenital conditions. And currently, and segmental bone defect means a defect that is too large to be healed by the natural healing capacity of the bone. Disc. Bring you an example. And current gold standard to treat that is basically through autographs meaning that bone from part of the body is harvested and is implanted in, in, the, in the defect site. The problem with that, it has, it has limited availability, of course, and it has donor cell morbidity. So of course, synthetic materials can be used for that. And many of you are familiar with metallic heat implants, probably with metallic scaffolds as well. So metals are beautiful materials because they are stiff, strong, and tough. Um, so, and it's relatively easy to, to form them into complex shapes. But the problem with metals is that they are not as bioactive as, as bioceramics and bioglass. So in general, bioceramics and bioglasses can offer a much better recapitulation of the biophysical and biochemical properties of bone than is currently possible with metallic implants. The problem with bioceramics, there are two problems. One of, one of them is that it's hard to form them into complex shapes. With, with, um, precise internal architectures without sacrificing the mechanical properties. And another problem is that they are brittle, they are not tough. So if you look at the bioceramic scaffolds that uh, have been developed through traditional manufacturing techniques through, for example, sacrificial sponge templating or foaming, you can see an irregular internal architecture that compromises the mechanical properties because there are areas of high stress concentration within the material as the material is loaded. So mechanical properties are compromised. Also, because of this irregularity, um, the interconnection between the pores are not perfect, are not very well controlled. And that basically compromises the nutrition supply and cell migration through the, sca through the, through the scaffold and compromising the tissue regeneration capacity of the material. The implication is that there is no currently any bioceramic implant or a scaffold for load bearing regions of the musculoskeletal system. Of course, 3D printing is a solution. And over the past two, two decades, many 3D printing solutions, many 3D printing technologies have been developed for bioceramics. 
that can fall into two main categories. One of them is extrusion-based techniques, direct local broadcasting. Basically, the material is injected through a nozzle and you basically move that nozzle in order to make the architecture. The limitation with that is that the internal architecture of the material is limited by what can be constructed with cylindrical strands. Basically, you're limited to the shape of the nozzle to in, in the shapes that, that you make. The other technique, the other category of the technique is selective laser based sintering. The problem with that is that it uses a high power laser. So um, it's not environmental friendly and it's also expensive. So in HANA's lab, I developed a technique based on photopolymerization to solve these challenges. Any shape and architecture can be made. So basically circumventing the problem with robot casting technique and a low power UV laser system is used. So I basically use a $4,000 um, desktop printer to develop the technology. So here's the details of how it works. I'm glad to discuss uh, how it works exactly, but uh, it's not probably the purpose of this, this meeting. So I'm going to skip this thing and the innovations in, in our technology and why we have been successful. Um, the important thing probably to share is, to, is that we can now make any porous structure or any solid structure in any shape. So I'll bring you a few examples here, porous structures that basically use for ceramic, that can be basically used for bioceramic scaffolds. Dense architectures can be used for um, biomedical devices or other devices, for example, for high temperature applications or for armor applications, or it could be a combination of dense and porous architecture. So we are basically not limited to any shape and internal architecture anymore, as long as it falls within the resolution of the system. Uh, basically, the minimum feature size that we can print currently is around 300 micrometers. And because of this, because we had full control over the architecture, we could basically print um, internal architectures to decrease the internal stresses within the material. Uh, for example, an architecture I'm showing you here, guided by the final autonomous simulations. We were not limited in terms of composition of the material as well. So we could optimize the composition of the material in order to improve the mechanical properties of the base ceramic as well. And that's why we could make bioceramic scaffolds made of this composition with 35 porosity, with 35% porosity that reached a stiffness and a strength of 40 couple. So the composition is also patented as or another patent that I discussed a bit. And this could be made in any um, shape, in anatomical size and shape. Um, so basically opens, it's, it opens a pathway towards translating these materials. It's, it paves the path for it. Um, and then once I was working in the lab, and I realized that the amount of shrinkage a ceramic undergoes depend on its concentration of particles. So if you have higher concentration of particles within the ceramic component, it, it will shrink less. If you have lower concentration of particle, it will shrink more. And then I was thinking, if I print components with different concentration of ceramic particles in different regions of the component, some regions of that component will shrink more, some regions will shrink less, and that can drive shape changes during sintering. And that is why we call it Fourier printing. And I explored a bit with bending. I made bilayers. The bottom layer here has higher concentration. The, lower, the, the top layer has lower concentration. And during the sintering, the top layer basically shrinks more, and that can derive shape changes. Here I'm showing you that by actually adjusting the mismatch of concentration between the two layers, you can basically adjust the level of uh, shrinkage, that, the level of bending that you can achieve, the level of mismatch between the shrinkage and then the level of bending that you can achieve. And then I was thinking if I decrease the concentration in a narrow region on one of the layers, what will happen is that in that narrow region, I will have less shrinkage. And that can basically derive a folding mechanism, not only bending, we can go to folding as well. And here is to show you that the level of folding that we can achieve um, can be adjusted based on the mismatch of concentration between the, between the different regions. And my honors student, Zhi Ding, is helping me a lot in, in, in doing these experiments. We are exploring a lot of uh, different shape changes uh, currently, and um, that, that can be quite exciting too. Um, and based on these technologies, we developed a few collaborations already. One of them is 
Bithalos, uh, a couple of them are Bithalos previous collab collaborators, uh, with Shinkoin Jiang at uh, Shanghai and his team, we are looking at the architectural effects on the tissue regeneration capacity and also on the mechanics aspects of things. For example, you can see here on the left is the scaffold that can be printed with extrusion-based techniques, where the internal architecture is made with cylindrical strut. It's our new technique, we could make a scaffold's negative replica of that. A scaffold that is basically has some holes. So it's basically negative of the scaffold that, is, that can be manufactured with robocasting. And we are looking at the effects. There are some very interesting trends there. Um, I don't have time to discuss all of these. We are working on drug delivery with um, Aaron Schneider and his team at Westmead. Uh, we are coating these scaffolds with different concentrations of BMP2 and ZA, and looking at the effects of, of these drugs. We are working on plasma functionalization with Marcelo Bilek and Ben Mahaban and, and their team. Um, we started to work with, um, with Omid Kabe and his team on, on the hermetic encapsulation, um, ceramics that can be used for that. We can basically print. Uh, and with Alessandro Tunis and his team on wave guys for, for, for photonic signals. So the 3D printing, 4D printing technologies that we developed can be used for, for diverse applications. That's, that's what I wanted to, to say here. I can bring you some example of one of, um, of the one of the collaborative projects that we have. Um, we basically use these scaffolds to for drug delivery because currently in the market, what is used for delivery of uh, drugs and biomolecules like bone morphogenetic protein to is uh, um, collagen scaffold that has limited moldability and poor mechanical properties. On the contrary, or 3D printed ceramics were very strong and they could be made into any shape and any internal architecture. Um, so it basically solves these challenges. And that's why we collaborated with, uh, with uh, Aaron Schneider and his team, and they basically coated these scaffolds with different concentrations of BMP2 and a bisphosphonate that is called zelandronic acid. Is basically ZA, and the role of BMP2 is to induce bone formation. The role of ZA is basically to, to inhibit osteoclast function and increase retention of the bone. The hypothesis was that can drug deliver, like can delivery of these bone molecules and drugs enhance the bone formation, especially for delivery of BMP2 and ZA. So after four weeks and using a heterotrophic ossification muscle model, the, the samples are retrieved, and we could see that the bone formation can be augmented by delivery uh, of, these, of these bone molecules. So I don't talk about the results so much in order not to get you bored, <laughs> but the short message was that we, we, actually, we are actually collaborating and exploring all the areas that, that, um, that can be used, uh, that these ceramics are useful for that are no 3D printing technology. And we realized that um, the, the bone in growth can be augmented by delivery of these biomolecules like BMP2 and ZA. And I was thinking that, can I capture it in a mechanical model? Because in practice, we cannot harvest the sample and do a mechanical test on them. Can we have a very fast tool to predict the level of stiffness and the strength amplification inside the scaffold as the bone grows inside them? And what we need is basically to do some imaging, a CT imaging or something, just to get the values of the new bone formation. And based on that, and this model that they recently developed, we can, be, we can predict uh, the level of stiffness and, uh, and the strength amplification based on the properties of the bone, the properties of the ceramic, and the, the values of the bone groups, the volume of the new bone that has been grown inside the material, and the comparison between the model and experimental results were, were quite encouraging. So simple models like that could be used to, to capture the mechanics of uh, these scaffolds. So in summary, what I wanted to convey in this, in this talk is that we developed a stereolithography technique that can, for ceramics that can be used for diverse applications in biomedical application and other applications too. Uh, so far, we have used this technique to print, this, to print the scaffolds that reach the, the stiffness and the strength of cortical bone. Um, we are exploring architectural effects uh, in uh, tissue regeneration and the effects of architecture on tissue regeneration and mechanics of the scaffolds. We, we can print any ceramic composition basically, and we can look at the effect of them. This printing technique could be used for um, many other applications as well. 
and at the end i want to acknowledge the all the funding agencies that supported me uh, throughout my career so far and uh, leaders of the biomaterials tissue engineering research unit Al-Azriqat and Colin Johnston team members and collaborators um, and uh, especially Andy Wang and Ji Ding and they helped a lot with the experiments and Ji my students also collaborators all the collaborators including Aran and his PhD student I can I thank you so much for, for listening to this talk and I'm happy to discuss aspects of, of this talk or any other any other question you might have well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Where is the clap? Thank you very much, Mohammed, for that uh, rapid overview of your life and research achievements. Uh, thank you for keeping it under the half hour. The point was, I think, also to only give a, a brief flavor of what you do to allow for any conversations or any, any question at all, I think, that pops yeah. up in the um, in the viewer's mind to just ask you. I know I have now a list of things that are an assortment of uh, human and scientific questions just on the side here. Uh, uh, but perhaps if uh, if anybody has any questions or want to say something, even it could be a comment, can be just a, a chat, anything at all. Um, feel free to maybe put up your hand, and I will uh, I will take a look. Where is the section here? Does anybody have anything to say or have a question for Muhammad? If not, I might just start with one. I, I have to say from the from the get go. Um, there was that moment where you've got that A star scholarship that mm -hmm. allowed you to go to Singapore. And one of the things that I was wondering, given also how many uh, requests I get from students from Iran who want to study at Sydney and so forth, what, what was it about your particular application at that point? And what was the journey, even as a student, that allowed you to make that, 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 that journey and, and get an A star scholarship to go to Singapore? What was that journey like for you? I'd be very curious to hear that. I think uh, the fact that I enjoyed doing cool things during my undergrad, I was not just going there and pass courses and get good marks, although I was, I was with high distinction, I finished my bachelor's. But so is it, no, but that's a question, is it just getting good grades or was there any no, 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 no. about not, your application that made it yeah, successful? Exactly, it was not only because of that, it was because I was involved in two cheap projects with one of them was, was uh, Mahmoud Hamami, uh, and he was a, a great mentor back in, when I was doing my bachelor's to do, uh, for example, molding on, uh, on polymers and on metals, basically. And, and I did some cool things there. I don't want to go through details, technical details of things. And, and then I put that in, into my application that I did this research and I made this successful because of this innovation. You know what I mean? And they liked it. I think that was the key because there were other students with good grades too. Um, um, but they like the fact that I'm fascinated to do research and I come up with ideas to solve problems. You know what I mean? So at that point, you wouldn't have had any publications at undergraduate. No. It was just, no, no, so no. I think, it, so it was good grades on top of your uh, other kinds of initiatives, I see. Exactly. And, I, and then I explained uh, in my, you know, when you're applying for this scholarship, there is a letter of intent, you know. And then I explained in the letter of intent that this is something I achieved and this is, I was given this problem and I came up with this solution to solve it. I see. You know what I mean? All right, all right. That played this... a role and I think that played a role. But also I had an interview and during interviews sometimes people just like some other people, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. Um, sometimes people connect with, with people and they see things in, in them and they just fire them. <laughs> so. Uh, Amandeep looks like she wants to say something, Amandeep. <laughs> No, no, I quite agree <laughs> with uh, what Muhammad is saying. Um, yeah, so, oh, sorry, I had a question in mind. Yeah. Please, please, go ahead. Okay, um, I was just wondering, like, what was the most challenging thing that you came across in your journey this far? And how did you overcome it? You mean the research challenge? Well, it could be anything. <laughs> oh. I think uh, the, cha the, the current challenge for me, honestly, is to secure a job <laughs> in academia. And, uh, Dream in terms of the, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the current challenge, to secure a ten tenure track job. Um, um, so oh, I can talk a, little, a lot about that, but let's skip that part. 
in terms of research challenge, um, I think uh, I, have, I have faced a lot of challenges. It's hard for me to say which one was really more challenging. I can name at least three, four that I worked months and years on to, to finish. You know what I mean? To, to, to tackle. Yeah. So research is, is always challenging. If you want to do meaningful research, challenge is there. If, yeah. if nobody, if you don't want to repeat a recipe and you want to develop something that you thought of and you want to develop it, then it's challenging. It takes time. Yeah. So we, we have a, uh, I completely agree. And maybe I'll come back and, and, and pester you more about this question a little later, Mohammed, because mm -hmm. I don't think you've answered it to satisfaction. I think Amadeep is still craving for a little story about overcoming life's difficulties. But uh, uh, mm -hmm. we have a question here on the chat, uh, which is a technical one from Zahiri Mahmoud. Um, how do you uh, incorporate the drugs into the bioceramics? So um, our collaborators use um, bioresolver coatings. They loaded it with drugs and they coated the material with those bioresolvable polymer coatings. So we couldn't, uh, so we didn't actually mix it with the ceramic resin itself, but uh, they basically coated it with a bioresolvable polymer coating. So what sort of solubility um, are you looking for to incorporate anything in bioceramics? Do you want to be, do you want them to be soluble in aqueous or non-aqueous um, solvents? It, so that depends on the absorption capability of the surface of the ceramics. Right now, we are improving that absorption capability, yeah. but uh, yeah, you could basically coat the surface of uh, ceramics with, um, with a molecule like a, like silane or something. A silane can be covalently bonded to the ceramic, and the other end of the silane can form hydrogen bonds to the to the polymer to any polymer basically. Or you could, uh, with um, Marcella and Behna, we are basically working on the functionalization with plasma to improve that bonding between inorganic and organic. Uh, but usually it's not, a, it's not a big challenge if you just want to coat, if you don't care about the actual bonding between the ceramic and, and the inorganic phase, then it's usually easy to just have a bonding there. Although the bonding might not be very strong. Yeah. I see not many questions coming through. I have I have a bunch, so I'll just keep going until people have the uh, have have, uh, have have the need to step in. Um, one of the things you mentioned. So we are we are currently working on on a project uh, together. But you mentioned this feature size of three hundred micron, right? So we are at Sydney Nano, so that's a few orders of magnitude more than what Sydney Nano is about. And and given that in order to do this, there is UV light involved, which has you know a few hundred nanometer. Uh, wavelengths and your molecules are also at that you know uh, rather small how how come this feature size is so large and what can you do to make it smaller with it with 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 the and how do you even come up with that number so if i saw some of the some of the graphs you showed some of the pictures those holes were 300 microns i saw like a hole that was 300 micron with the 300 yeah. micron scale bar next to it it looked like if you wanted to you could go way smaller than that. Uh, maybe you could go back. To, I think maybe it's one more slide back. Um, yeah, I can. I, I know. Um, this what, uh, is what this maybe just one yeah. more, just so we can. Be, yeah, this one here. On the, uh, that's right, right there on the that third picture. That's a three hundred micron. This is something you've made, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, and so that so that's smaller than three hundred micron, but also it seems like you could easily go less in terms of the whole size. Yeah, in, in photopolymerization based printing of ceramics, there are basically two methods that you can follow. One of them is the slurry based methods that you basically mix ceramic particles with the photopolymer and you use um, a laser light to, to, to solidify the material. So the way it works is basically, let me explain to you a little bit here. So here is a mixture of ceramic particles with the photopolymer, the substrate will move down, a layer of the, that resin is entrapped between the transparent shielding here and the substrate, the shine is, uh, the light is shown through that transparent um, membrane and a layer of material is basically solidified. The substrate will move up, another layer of the resin will go underneath and this process is repeated until a 3D, 3D basically geometry can be made. So here you are limited to the spot size of the laser and also a scattering by the ceramic particles. You know? And that, that basically uh, governs the finest resolution that you can achieve. You know? 
And that, so and that, and, but that you're suggesting that that number is, is a few hundred microns. And that, that, that seems to me- in the, in the current setup, in the current, sorry to interrupt, but in the current uh, laser system that I have, uh, and the part, the particle size that I'm using is that. Let me finish. There is another method that is basically printing pre-ceramic polymers. So you don't have to incorporate any ceramic particles inside the resin. The resin can turn into a ceramic at high temperature. So you use a pre-ceramic uh, resin, and we recently wrote a leaf grant to be able to do that. A leaf for a nanoprinter, and inside that nanoprinter, what we will use is basically a pre-ceramic polymer. We, we functionalize it with, uh, with photo absorbers, uh, and, uh, and, and that's, that's how we want to actually do nanoprinting with ceramics. Because you don't have to incorporate any particles, you're not limited by the scattering of the ceramic particles. And with, with that nanoprinter, we have a very small spot size of the laser, and that's why we are aiming to achieve nanoprinting in ceramics using pre-ceramic polymers. I hope this clear. So, but that's not, so you're saying that you applied for a grant to be able to do that, it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah, we applied for a grant, we are waiting for the results. And hopefully if we get that nanoprinter, because of the spot size of the laser, that's is basically a two photon laser. There. It's a much more advanced laser system there. Um, we will be able to, to print nanoceramics. Yeah. So if you, did you say this is a commercially available printer, by the way? Is this something? It is a commercially available you just printer, hacked into it? but no, I say this one I hacked into it. But, <laughs> the, but the nano printer we are trying to get is currently used for, for polymers mostly. And uh, the, the nano printer is, is basically used for, for polymers. And what I want to do is basically use it for ceramics. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Do you have a do you have any other questions, Amandeep, by any chance? Or anyone else, for that matter? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, of course. My, my name is uh, Jahiri Mahmoud, actually. I'm working under Vincent Gomes uh, in uh, chemical engineering. Mm. Uh, actually, I have a question that, uh, how do you incorporate that um, uh, drug into the bioceramic polymer? Oh. So how do you uh, incorporate that drug? Do you have any... Uh, so, um, example or something we can see that. So, like I mentioned, what I did was to develop the three D printing technology, and I also developed novel ceramic compositions. What our collaborator did was to basically load bioresorbable polymers with the rocks, such as BMP two and bisphosphonates, such as LA, the hydrochloric acid, and they basically coated the ceramic. Uh, they basically immerse, what they did is basically just to dip the, the ceramic scaffold inside that, uh, that, uh, that polymer and they just take it out and let it dry. Is it so, uh, so my uh, question is that um, if we incorporate a dra drug into the bioceramic polymer, like photopolymer, and if we use that one for uh, biological purposes, is there any effect of that photopolymer or that ceramic, any side effect or not? So yeah, I, I get what you're, yeah, um, what you're mentioning. Um, so what, what I do is basically after the printing is done, so inside the resin, the ceramic resin is a photopolymer and ceramic particles. Probably I should have explained this thing. So after the printing is done, in each of these struts, can you see my slides? Yes. Each of these struts are made, are made of a cross-link photopolymer and ceramic particles. But if you have enough ceramic particles there, and if the size of ceramic particles is fine enough, when you sinter it, when you increase the temperature, the photopolymer will be eliminated, and you will end up with, with, you will end up with ceramic particles that are basically sintered together to, to make the bioceramic scaffold. So at the end, there's no photopolymer in the final product because it's sintered. There's, there's no photopolymer in the final product does it make sense? It does okay, okay. And then we coat it with, uh, yeah, with bioresorbable coatings containing the rods. Okay. So, so um, the main frame of the photopolymer, it won't be still there after finished final product. No, no, in final product, there's no photopolymer. It will be eliminated during sintering. Okay, okay. And uh, you have shared that uh, plasma treatment of your scaffold. So what uh, kind of properties you would expect for that for a plasma treatment, Ex especially for what reason or what was your main purpose to do plasma, plasma treatment? 
So the main purpose is to improve attachment of the inorganic phase to the surface of the ceramics. So how do you attach that one in, in inorganic phase? How do it attach? Can you please tell me? Plasma treatment is not my expertise. Like I said, we collaborate with Marcella and Ben to do the, plas okay. the plasma treatment. Um, the, the basic physics behind it, uh, I'm not sure um, how it works, um, but it's just a surface functionalization to, to improve the attachment of inorganic phase to the, to the, to the ceramic. Okay, okay. Actually, yeah, I think uh, I can ask Marcella. I'm doing a PhD and I am also working on the plasma treatment. That's why I want to learn more. That's, I, that's mm -hmm. why I asked you. Anyway, I can contact Marcella regarding that question. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question. It's good. Uh, I, I saw that you uh, asked for it in the chat and I had mentioned it earlier, but it's, uh, it's nice. You're welcome to jump in and, and have the conversation with Mohammed. That's, that's why you're yeah, here. Please. So, so we have, we have, we have another question here in the chat. So Athena, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask Mohammed. Actually, I, my, I was uh, connected with the desktop and desktop audio was not uh, ah, working. That's okay. why I connected that's all right. with the mobile. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All right, Athena, if, if you like, you can unmute yourself. And ask the question. Yeah. Um, hi, Mohammed. Love to talk Hello. and your journey research. Um, so you mentioned using the concentration mismatch, sorry, mismatch to fine tune mm -hmm. the bending of ceramics after mm -hmm. sintering. Mm -hmm. um, what are the applications of this? Yeah, I have the same question actually. I, I, this is funky, but what are you what are you what are you using this for, man? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in terms of application, this is basically only scientific curiosity for me, really. Um, the applications could, could, this could be used for, for, for like people, if you look at other 4D printing ceramic uh, papers, they use much more complex processes. For example, they tailor the orientation of elongated particles to derive the shape changes and these things. But um, in terms of applications, I'm not yet convinced. They claim things that this could be used for armor applications and um, for aerospace applications to get um, complex shapes, but I'm not convinced. Is, 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 does, can that arrow go both ways? Can you make this thing walk? What I mean no, is right now no, it goes from straight to bend. It's not yeah. reversible. It's not reversible. It is not. If it was reversible, it could be used for robotics application. I can see that. Mm. Yeah. So it's but a one-way one street, isn't it? It's a one-way, yeah. 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 So it's 4D, but no, without time travel. It's 4D because during <laughs> the time that is inside, so it's 4D, it could be called 5D as well because there's a temperature involved as well. So you need time and temperature to derive the shape changes, you know, because it happens during sintering. And sintering, you do it at high temperature. So it's basically, you need time and temperature, but it's not reversible. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I'm also yeah. thinking. Yeah. We might we might have a offline chat about what we could do with yeah. this in terms yeah. of our light guiding project. Actually, yeah. there could be some fun stuff in there as well. Yeah. yeah. Um. I think. Oh, I do. Have, sorry, if there is no other questions, please. Adina, by the way, are you satisfied with that answer? Sorry, I also jumped in and interrupted. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah. I definitely found it a bit funny when uh, Mohammed said nothing at the moment. <laughs> 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 Yo, uh, no, no. It's basically scientific curiosity to me not right now. Absolutely. Good stuff, Mohammed. Love, love yeah. a bit of curiosity. It's good. Yeah. So, so um, my, my question is, can I just be provocative with your, with your, well, your first slide when you showed that bulletproof glass that was, yeah. looked awesome and you, <laughs> you mentioned it has three, four percent, what did you mention, uh, transmission. I have to say though, it does have, if I look at the one on the left and the one on the right, uh, the one yeah. on the right has a lot more grids on it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, because, I, yeah. I, are I you sure? See. I mean, it, isn't yeah. that a bit of a deal breaker in terms of whether or not people would actually want this, I don't know, on the presidential car or something? I don't know. <laughs> That's, yeah, but you should look at the recent science paper that we published. Um, so we, we did this rigorous uh, optical transparency test on these materials. Um, according to those, like if you look at, I'm, I'm showing you at, at an angle basically. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, at this angle, you could, that's basically more vis most, um, you can see it more visibly, much, much more visibly uh, compared to when you look at it from top, you know what I mean? 
I see. Uh, I see. But yeah. see, the thing is, like, the transparency of, say, one individual unit might be high, but then it looks like all those units are connected no, uh, no, by these did, grids. No, no, we, we did actually test on, on these exact samples, um, a standard test uh, for optical transparency, and it loses 3 to 4%. But for presidential, it, in terms of translation to industries, that's, the concern is much more than that. Yeah. There are many things involved in translation, including politics. And, uh, oh. Um, yeah. Oh, so, okay. yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> what can you, can you, can you, what can you say about that? Because if, uh, yeah, there, are, there, many company, there are many companies working on laminated glasses, yeah. Uh -huh. And then you jump in and you say, okay, your technology can help them. So, I don't know. It's, I'm not sure. Probably. All right. Uh, Amandeep, I see you're unmuted. Do you have a question or are you, do you have another follow up? Shall we have just a few more minutes? I might, we might just go till say 5 to 11 to give everyone time to go to their next uh, tea break or meeting. So we have a few more minutes to chat if you like. I just had one question about your printing method. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, like, is there any particular application you're interested in taking up in the future for that printing method, if you've identified it, or any particular application you're more excited from the ones that you've identified to sort of dig into a bit more in the future, I guess. Yeah, we are on our way to translating these things for, for bone implants. Yeah. And Halo has significant ex expertise in that area. So we are on our way for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, is yeah. if I may ask, so are, as people might know that you recently won one of these prestigious um, Australian Research Council uh, Early Career Awards, yeah. um, what what aspects of this talk were included in that application, and, and where does where does this where does this lead to in that application? So, so both, both so how does how sorry how does that connect to I guess the next few years of your research career I guess is my question. Yeah, both both three D printing and four D printing um, actually connects to my to my decra. Um, so in three D printing, what I will do next is to improve the fracture toughness of the ceramics. In four D printing, what I will do next is to explore uh, much more complex shape changes, um, so, and that's the, that's basically my decra. So, what, in that application, uh, was the fundamental uh, was the fundamental science aspect of it sufficient, or did you also include a killer application that uh, makes this a no brainer? <laughs> so, yeah, in, in the first application, you know that my first application was not successful, and uh -huh. it was partly because I didn't have a strong preliminary results there. And if if somebody wants to apply for Decra, I would actually encourage her or him to to take care of two things. One of them is that to put your ideas in an exciting way. Partly, I mean, for my case, there was no much difference between my first and second application. And uh, the two differences was really, very really these. The, the ideas looked more exciting, the wording of it. So it should, it should basically be exciting. So if a, uh, if a leader um, is sitting with a glass of wine and read, uh, reads your application, likes it, so that's important. And also you should have a strong preliminary results. Don't be worried that people say, okay, this guy has already done it. I mean, you, you should propose much more things to do, of course, but you should, put, you should put a strong preliminary results to show that you can do it. And it's already been done to some extent. And then people will trust that you can do it. Uh, so, I mean, for my case, my story was like that. It um, was not successful. I realized I talked to 10, 20 different people. Thank you. Like, if you are listening to this talk, to this talk, thank you so much for your advice, really. Um, and um, then I took care of these two things. But from your point of view, then the fundamental science is is sufficient because very often you get told. I mean, yeah. I remember being told this back in the day that you need to have some very strong application or a convincing a convincing argument that say in the third year of the project, after looking at the fundamental science, this translates to in, in something, you know, a, a, a groundbreaking new application, let's say. Um, and was that, yeah. was that included there as well by any chance? Because at the yeah. moment, your response yeah. seems to focus. I, I mean, I love fundamental science and I think it's yeah. important. It has, um, can go in unpredictable ways, but yeah. very often, um, you know, you get asked to at least pitch uh, 
where this might lead to in terms of a tangible practical device of some kind and uh, did you include that in your application yeah yeah in terms of application especially for 3d printing um, i discussed a lot in terms of both scientific breakthroughs and uh, in terms of toughening materials that i had uh, um, good experience with and also uh, in terms of translation like in different industries it could be used like we said for um, biomedical applications bone implants which could be used for armor applications. Ceramics are light, for example. If you manage to make them much tougher, uh, if you could, if you could claim that the ceramic could really replace a metal, it's, we cannot really claim in terms of fracture toughness of the material yet. Um, although I can actually show you a piece of the ceramic, you can throw it to the wall and it won't break. Uh, we've, so, I know I've actually done that test in your office. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so I it's... believe we did manage to break it, though. <laughs> I remember yeah, but you should really try hard to break it at, at this point. <laughs> Okay. But in terms of fracture toughness, we are still far, we are still far away from metals. I see. Um, Zahiri uh, has, you know, yeah. has just uh, put his camera on. Zahiri, do you have a question before we wrap yeah. up? Because we just got yeah, a couple of minutes. I have one more question. Please. Uh, actually, related to the uh, 3D printing. Um, Mohammed, I see uh, you have a lot of 3D printing experience. If I want to have a nano material, nano range of 3D printing, what is your suggestion to do that if I want to buy a nanometer range uh, 3D printing, like I want to print like one, uh, 100 nanometer or 200 nanometer size that what 3D printing you can suggest, I, you have a lot of experiences. Yeah. There are three, uh, three companies selling nanoprinters across the world. Um, I mean, many people are developing their own nanoprinters, um, uh, including in our lab, um, Peter Newman is developing a printer. I don't think it can go to nano, but it can go to micro. But, but if, if you want to develop something, what you need is a two photon printer, a few um, piezoelectric, basically, um, uh, substrates, um, to, to move things very accurately, uh, a two photon, uh, two photon laser system, and then you could build a nano printer and, and good optics. Um, then you could build a nano printer. If you're interested in buying a nano printer, there are three companies. I don't know the names on top of my head. I know I know only the one NanoScribe. Um, I have the quotations for all three companies, but NanoScribe is the world leading, uh, basically, uh, industry commercialized nanoprinter. They, they are, they are world leading and they are most famous for this. Um, so they're called, they're called nanoscribe. The do you know, where, do you know where they can be found in Australia? Maybe if Zahiri wants to contact someone, I believe there is one in Melbourne for sure. Do we have Yeah, any? there is one in Melbourne and we recently wrote a leaf grant for that. So, but is that so the only one? Do you know where, where else, in, where in Australia they can be found actually? Who has? Some? I think Queensland has, has one too. So there's two in Australia, Zahiri, yeah, yeah. if you need yeah. a... Okay. A nano 3D printer, there's a couple of places you yeah, can go to, but yeah. not in New South Wales, as it turns out. Maybe us. Yeah, not in New South Wales. And we hopefully have one soon. Ah, Hala, Hala has. Yeah, told thank us you, Hala. I have got uh, two names you have uh, suggested. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So it's 5 to 11. So I'm, I'm happy uh, to give everyone uh, an early mark uh, for whatever they have up next in this uh, busy time end of year. Uh, thank you very much for our inaugural, uh, for coming to our inaugural Meet the Authors session. Thank you very much for your engagement and your questions. Um, We're very pleased with, with the outcome and the amount of people that have decided to uh, drop in. I'll be on the lookout for more. I think Mohammed himself has been, uh, will, is, is, is volunteered to organize the next one. Um, and if you perhaps are an EMCR at the University of Sydney, um, working in nano research and wish to showcase some of uh, your personal experience, some of your research, please get in touch with us. Uh, uh, you can write to myself or you can look us up as the EMCR network. Um, and we'll be happy to, to provide this, uh, this platform for you to share some of your work. Um, Amadeep, do you have any uh, final, final words before we sign off? Or Mohammed as well? <laughs> I just want to thank you all. Um, great discussions after my talk too, so I like it very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and I think I speak for everyone when I say that it was a really great and engaging session and we look forward to um, you know you getting in touch with us to showcase your research and your journey. Bye everyone.